Decision for Life. Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Hey, take your Bible, if you will, and look with me to the book of Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, and we're going to be picking it back up where we left off last Sunday. Hebrews chapter number eight, if you will, and uh, we'll begin reading in a few minutes in verse number six, Hebrews chapter number eight. Um, you know, I, I don't know about you, <clears throat> you know, I just turned one of those milestone years uh, this past summer, and um, I, I don't know about you, but the older I get, is this true with you? The older I get, the better life is with me. Is that the way it is with you? I, I, I'm serious. The older I become, the more I'm enjoying life. In February, um, Kathy and I will celebrate uh, 50 years of marriage. I, I'm really excited about it. I, I am. Uh, you know, when I, when I first laid eyes on Kathy, the very first day, I fell head over heels in love with her. That, just in a second. First date, I told her uh, that, you know, I was going to marry her. Uh, it scared her to death, but I was as serious as I could be. I just knew and uh, deeply in love. But I want to tell you something. I love her more today. And life and marriage with her is better now than it's ever been and the good part about it is it just keeps getting better. So this is kind of the theme of the book of Hebrews. It's all about things getting better. Uh, we talked earlier about a better priesthood. I, I'm kind of blown away this morning uh, <clears throat> because uh, Matthew and I did not plan out today. We didn't plan out that today would be the Lord's Supper Day. We didn't plan out today uh, where I would be in the text it's kind of really um, just a God thing that we are where we are today because I'm going to be talking this morning, uh, you know, we talked about a better priesthood, but I'm going to be talking this morning about a better covenant. Say the word covenant. Talking about a better covenant that we have uh, with the Lord. Now, the text this morning, if, if you've read it, uh, maybe jumped ahead just a little bit just to see where we're going to be you discover that it is really a quote, much of it is really a quote from Jeremiah 31. And it talks about there in Jeremiah 31 where God is making a new contract. He's making a new covenant. It's not based on the same old stuff that the old covenant was based on, but it's based on uh, something entirely different, something much more wonderful. And what he's gonna be doing this morning uh, is contrasting the old covenant with the new covenant. And the new covenant is based on what we've been singing about all morning long, which is the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the whole book of Hebrews is about. Now, the writer of Hebrews is coming on and he's doing his very best to convince the Hebrew Christians to keep them from going back into Judaism, going back under the old covenant. And he says to them, you really don't want to go do that because it's not nearly as good as what God has for us under the new covenant. It's a lot better. That's the thesis of Hebrews. Now I want to give you some out of the text this morning. I want to give you some reasons why the new covenant is better than the old covenant. First of all, write this down somewhere. It's better because the promises are better. It's, say the word promises. It's better because the promises are better. I heard about an old boy, he was telling his cousin about how much in love he was with his, uh, uh, with his girlfriend and how he had proposed to her. And, and his cousin said, well, how did you do it? He said, well, I just got before and said, honey, I just love you so much. Um, you, you know, I may not have a new Mercedes like Johnny Green does. And I may not make uh, all, all of that much money as Johnny Green does to take you to Hawaii. And I couldn't buy you the diamonds that Johnny Green could buy you. And, but I just know Johnny Green couldn't love you like I do. And, and, and I may not be able to take you on those exotic, exotic trips like Johnny Green could, but honey, I want you to know I love you and I want to marry you. And she said, well, honey, I love you too, but tell me more about Johnny Green. 
uh, the, the writer is t- <laughs> the writer is saying, you know, we have a better priesthood, and now we have a better covenant. We have a better sanctuary. We have better worship. Uh, the promises of God are better. Now, we're going to pick it up in verse number 6, chapter number 8, if you will. And we're going to go through verse 13. So look at verse 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant which was established upon better promises. Now I want to give you some of those promises if I could for just a minute. There's the promise of a personal benefit. Now we got the Lord's Supper this morning and those promises came in. They were instituted in in that upper room when Jesus got his disciples and he said to them, uh, you you know, this blood is the new covenant. It is a, uh, this cup is the sign and the symbol of a new covenant that I am making uh, that my blood is going to be poured out uh, for you. You understand Hang on this. I think sometimes we get a little bit confused with this. But when Jesus poured out his blood, he didn't pour it out for a community. He didn't pour it out for some corporate entity. He didn't pour it out for a particular nation. Uh, When you think about the blood of Jesus Christ, it is extremely uh, important that you understand that his blood is very personal It was for you that he poured out his blood. It's a personal promise. Then the promise of the Holy Spirit. One of the most important verses really in the New Testament, uh, write this down somewhere, is in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6. And it goes like this. Who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament or the New Covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. Now the only thing that the Hebrews had was an old rock where God had chiseled out the Ten Commandments. uh, This lifeless piece of rock. But the the new promise uh, in the new covenant is not a rock, but a living, vibrant person in the Holy Spirit that God has gifted uniquely to you and to me. Then there's the third promise, and it is the promise of eternal inheritance. Uh, Look over just one more chapter to chapter 9. Look at verse 15. And for this cause, he is the mediator of the new covenant, that by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first covenant, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Now, I need, you to, I need you to hear me a minute because the writer of Hebrews here is not trashing the old covenant. He's not ranking the old covenant uh, in any shape, form, or fashion. Uh, but the Bible says here that we are coming into a new uh, inheritance. <laughs> Uh, You may be driving a gremlin today, but thank God as a believer, (laughs) you're headed toward an eternal inheritance that is mind-boggling, that is indescribable. It is is not based on gold or silver or any kind of uh, human thought about wealth and wealth management. It simply is an eternal inheritance that defies human description. You say, well, what are you talking about if it's not gold, silver, and wealthy stuff like that? What do you mean it's an eternal? I'm talking about nothing less than being in the presence of the Lord Jesus himself. Now, let me give you the second uh, part of this. It is a uh, personal covenant. Not only uh, is this new covenant better because of the promises, uh, it's a personal covenant. Pick it up now in verse 7. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he saith, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Once again now, 
Um, I, I said it a moment ago, got ahead of myself just a little bit. He's not trashing the old covenant. Uh, he's not ranking against it. He's not saying that it was faulty or wrong or blemished. He's coming along now and saying the problem was not the covenant, the problem was with the people. The problem was not what God said, the problem was what man did. They didn't understand the parameters nor the implications of the covenant that God had made with man. Now, in Romans chapter 7 and verse 7, you, you may want to turn over there with me. Just turn back a few pages and, and look with me, if you will. Uh, Romans chapter 7 and uh, look at verse 7, if you will. Here's what he says. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Is the old covenant sin? God forbid. No. I, I had not known sin but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. You see, the law was created by God without a blemish. It wasn't sinful. It wasn't deficient. It wasn't defective at all. And later on in that same chapter, Paul says that even the law was good in itself. So what was the problem? Well, both covenants were given by God for the people. And both of those covenants had blessings that were attached to them. So here's what God's doing here. Uh, it has to deal with personal covenant. God found fault with the people. I want to read verse 8 one more time if I could. Uh, for finding fault with them, with the people, he says. Uh, you understand something. This was a national covenant that was made for the Jewish people. There were no promises and no provisions for the Gentile people then at that point. Now, the original name for the Jewish people was given for the nation of Israel. And of course, you know that uh, there, there came some problems and the nation divided and you found that Israel was in the north and Judah then became part of that southern kingdom. Now watch with me in verse 9. For according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, saith the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts and I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people. Now, many, many, many years before the birth of Christ in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, God prophesied in there that there would be an order, there would be established a relationship uh, between him and the people that would be extremely personal. You understand, that's why that Christianity is so uniquely powerful among all of the world's religions because it's based upon the crucifixion and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ who comes back to live his life in us. You and I then are able to have and to know and experience a personal Savior. I posted this yesterday, and I, I, want, I wrote it in, in my lesson uh, for today, and, and I want you to hear it uh, very clearly. Here we go. You ready? Becoming a Christian is not committing our minds to a set of doctrines as important as they are. It has nothing to do with committing our intellect to a set of biblical truths as important as that is. It has everything to do with coming to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior personally demonstrated in our lives by the abiding presence of the Holy Spirit. Now, Jesus comes along and he criticized the Jews on one occasion and he says, well, you search the scriptures because you think that is in them is life. But he says, let me testify. The scriptures are important because they testify of me. Now, he wasn't putting the word down. He wasn't criticizing the word. He wasn't minimizing the word. 
it has a place and a purpose in all of our lives. How is that? Because it exposes Jesus to us. That's the word. I love the old hymn. He walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. I don't know about you, but, but now my, some of my friends, you know, they kind of raise some eyebrows when I talk to them about stuff like this. But I, I don't know about you, but I love to be able to talk to my Savior. I do. If I'm in the car, he's in the front seat with me. He thinks I'm a pretty good driver. I have a lot of great conversations with the Lord going down the road. I've had some of the greatest, uh, Brad, some of the greatest worship times in my life. I've been in the shower. I just get caught away with Jesus every once in a while. And just, you, you can't tell uh, where, where, where the water begins and the teardrops start. Uh, just, just worshiping and praising God. I, I, I've been on a golf course and just, just, just get caught away with the presence uh, of the Lord. I, I fill out my income tax and he's nowhere in that, near, no, no, he, 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 wherever. Wherever. It's amazing today. Here, here's, here's, here's a powerful thing. It is amazing today that when you leave this worship service, and after you've gone to life group and you go back and get in your car, you know what's amazing? <laughs> he leaves with you. He, he goes with you. It is a personal covenant that he has uh, made with us. If, any, if Jesus pumped anything into his disciples, he said to them, I will not leave you desolate. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. And the early church went around and turned the world right side up. They outlived, they outloved, they outprayed their Roman pagan contemporaries, not because they had more iPads and iPhones and internet and computers, but because they had the abiding presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in their life and they were aware of his presence. They knew he was with them. I, 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 and, and listen, there was nothing that they couldn't do. I went back and just read just a little bit uh, last evening, right, right before I went to bed. I, I just pulled up over there in the book of Acts and I saw that they were so full of Jesus that the people just said, let me just get into the shadow of the uh, Simon Peter. Just let me, let his shadow pass over me and I can be healed. How did that happen? They knew Jesus was abiding in their heart and in their life. If, if believers and, and, and contemporary Christianity needs anything today, it is a good baptism of the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ in our life, that God is with us and that he is our refuge and he is our strength. It's a very personal covenant. Hey, hey let me give you this third one because the pardon is better. It's a better covenant because the pardon is better. Look at verse 11. And they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from uh, the least to the greatest. No more priesthood. <laughs> there, there, by the way, did you know, and I've said this uh, maybe last week, week before, I, I'm just going to reiterate it to you. That there is no e existing priesthood in the world today. You, you say, well, now, preacher... The Roman Catholics have priests. The Episcopals have priests. The Greek Orthodox have priests. The Russian Orthodox have priests. Yes, I know all of that, but they are not legitimate. Why, why, how do you know? Because the Bible says that there is one mediator between God and man, and it's the man, Christ Jesus, who gave his life a ransom for all. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is our high priest. There's not a human priesthood except for the fact that all believers are, pre, we have the priesthood of believers, that you and I have direct access to a holy God. Look at verse number 12. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness and their sins and their iniquities 
will I remember no more. Now, what I'm about to tell you is worth the price of admission uh, for you to be here today. You, you see, the old covenant just pictured forgiveness. The old covenant was just a symbol of forgiveness, but absolutely incapable of granting forgiveness. It had nothing that could remove the tar stain sin that was evident in the lives of people. Nothing but the blood of Jesus can do that. Now, I don't have a whole lot of time to build on this, but I want to tell you that man's basic problem is sin. We are born into sin. Now, I know that these little sweet babies come along and they're pink and they're wrinkled and all of that kind of stuff and we want to ooh and gah and all of that kind of stuff over them. But in the, in the, in the very life of that new baby is the potential to do anything and everything as horrid and despicable as you could ever imagine. Now, it does not manifest itself till some time later when he's about two or three years old and he pushes his little sister down in the mud and pulls her hair and knocks her down and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but it does manifest itself uh, in that in a few years. Now, our culture has tried to minimize, explain away, and rationalize sin. You, you just listen to the news accounts when you find a murderer or a rapist and, and what they want to do is they'll go back and they'll try to dig up, now why did this person do such a thing? And they'll say, well, his mama, uh, she ate too many Hershey's Kisses when she was pregnant and all that. But we try to minimize it and to rationalize that behavior. And the press won't report. You won't ever read in here uh, where a press would say, because of sin, this happened. You won't see it. I want to be as sweet and kind and humble here as I possibly can. I'm really disappointed in our elected officials of using their high office seeking to legitimize what the Bible has described as perverted behavior. I, I'm, I'm really so disappointed in our elected high officials that are using their high office seeking to legitimize a lifestyle that the Bible says is perverted behavior. Now, I don't hate the homosexual. God does not hate the homosexual. God loves them, hates their sin, but loves them. And to say that it's only a different lifestyle. Ladies and gentlemen, I will remind you, it is Sin, and sin is sin. Well, you, you have a great meal, you go eat a nice steak somewhere at a restaurant, and you get up and you leave that restaurant without paying your bill, it is sin. And you might be able to say, well, I developed an aversion to touching money when I was 11 years old. <laughs> you understand, man's basic problem is sin and man's basic need is forgiveness. In Isaiah chapter 59, the Bible says that this sin has separated us from a holy God. And the only way that that sin will ever, or that gap will ever be dealt with is certainly not from human performance, not by works. And you can labor all that you want to to reform and to achieve and to climb the ladder toward God. You can do all of it you want to do, but there is not enough good works in any of us or combined in us that can ever deal with the economy of God. He allowed his only begotten son to come and to bridge that gap, and he and he alone is the solution to that gap. No other means. The new covenant provides a pardon that is inward. I, I love what he says right here. He will remember our sins no more. You say, now wait a minute. If he's holy God, if he's omnipotent, if he's omniscient, if, if, if he's all of that stuff, then he couldn't possibly forget something. 
If he's all-knowing, he couldn't forget. Well, God chose in his omnipotence and his omniscience. He chose and opted to forget our sins and never to lay them on our charge ever again. If you're in a marriage and your spouse commits adultery, that doesn't mean that you throw your marriage uh, in the dumps and walk away from it, the spouse could opt to forgive and never to bring it back up again if they chose to do so. That's what God did. Isn't that a wonderful thought that God in his power opted to say, you know what, because of the blood of my son covering your sin, I will never hold it against you ever again and I'll cast it into the deepest of the sea. All right, let me move on. It's a better covenant because a better permanency. Look at verse 13. And he saith, a new covenant, he hath made the first old. Now that which decayeth and waxeth old is ready to vanish away. Back, um, back in the uh, early 1900s, I had an old snapper lawnmower. Now, I'm telling you, that thing gave me more fit than you could ever imagine. It got old and decrepit and, and just laid down. And I'll never forget going down to Pageland, and I bought me an LX-188 John Deere lawnmower. And I brought that rascal home, and I threw away that old one, and I had me a brand new lawnmower. Great day in my life. Now the writer's saying here, the new has come and the old has got to go away. Now, so you have a picture of a friend of yours that has, uh, he's been away or she's been away for 35 years. You haven't seen from them. You haven't heard from them. Uh, you have had no knowledge of their whereabouts or what's been going on. And, and, and just kind of every day, you kind of pulled out that picture and you looked at that, uh, you looked at that picture of your long lost 35 year friend every day. But then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, that 35 year old friend now shows up. And they're sitting there in your room. But instead of the reality of their presence, you keep looking at their photograph. Now that's kind of the picture of what verse 13 is trying to relate to us. That the old covenant was just a shadow. But the reality has shown up that is full of pardon, full of grace, and, and, and full of mercy, and full of forgiveness, and full of heaven, and, and glory has come. What do you do? You put the picture away. Now, do we throw the old covenant away? What do we do about it today? Do we just say, okay, no, no, no. Does it have a purpose for today? Absolutely, yes. Because the old covenant really shows us the desperate need for the new covenant. And shows us our utter helplessness to do anything about our forgiveness. And later in the book of Hebrews, and we'll study this a little bit later on, let us be thankful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. Aren't you glad that the kingdom of God can ever be shaken in your life? You have a new purpose. We have new promises from Almighty God. This new covenant. We're, we're, we're gonna, in, in just a minute, the deacons are going to come and, and we're going to take the covers off and, and we're going to participate in that inaugural time when Jesus gathered his disciples together and he says, this cup is the new covenant, the new testament, the new promise in my blood which was shed for you. Hallelujah. What a savior that we have today. Hey, hey heads bowed, eyes are closed for just a minute. I wonder, um, 
How many of you are here this morning? You say, Pastor, without a doubt, I know that my sins have been forgiven. I have a personal, intimate relationship with Christ. My sins have been forgiven, and I know that if I were to die today, I would go to heaven. If you don't have a time and a place, you need one. And it could be right here, and it could be right now. If you're willing today to turn to Jesus Christ, for him to be the Lord and Savior of your life, I want you to pray something like this with me right where you're standing. Would you pray with me right now? Heavenly Father, I believe that Jesus Christ died on a cross for my sin. I believe that he rose from the dead on that third day. Father, I know that I'm a sinner and I need your forgiveness. Today, I willingly turn away from sin and with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Please forgive me of all my sin. I receive you into my heart as my Lord and as my Savior. If you prayed that prayer just then. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.